You know, Dr. Sabau was next to her brother when he was killed. But she shows no emotion at all. I don't understand it. That is because he's not dead. Now, come on, Doctor. Sure, the heart has ceased to beat. Respiration has stopped. Every known medical test would confirm that life has gone from the body. But you'd never convince Sabau of that. I'm afraid this is all a little beyond me. This is Haiti, Mr. Templar. Those who die violently avenge themselves. This is the land of the undead. The living dead, if you like. The zombie. Dr. Zombies. I thought they were just a legend perpetuated by horror movies. If you're interested, why don't you ask Sibel about it? She's supposed to have great powers. Around here, people treat her like a deity. Her father's the local Huga. It's a sort of witch doctor or high priest of the voodoo cult. Doctor, a while back you said something about the dead avenging themselves. Sabaa, she mentioned that Krager, the man who drove the car, would be dead before dawn. Then I thank God that I am not he. Welcome back to Geek Channel 8. I'm Eric. And I'm Johanna. I just finished a Netflix show called The Diplomat, which I have to say, from all of the artwork about the show, the trailer, everything, made it look like it was going to be super trashy and unbelievable. And You, you don't know, remember me telling you to watch that show? No, I don't. I don't remember. But obviously it was somewhere in the back of my reptilian hindbrain because, I, you know, eventually we were like, all right, we just need like a 50 minute fun, you know, silly, shiny show to watch. And I'm just going to say my husband definitely has a thing for Carrie Russell, like almost as fierce as my attachment to Gary Oldman. But Okay. Um, well, totally, she is totally kind of warranted. She's a fox. I'm. I'm not gonna lie. Well, she's also like in charge. You know. Well, that's that's a good point. <laughs> yeah. No, I hadn't hadn't thought about that angle. I really enjoyed it. It was not silly. I'm not gonna say it's serious television, but you know there were cliffhangers at the end of every episode, but not ridiculous cliffhangers. And there was some intrigue and relationship drama but not soap opera levels of drama and it's slick the international stuff is fun james bondy well done i thought okay listener johanna doesn't remember this but if you go back and listen to one of our earlier episodes i'm not sure which one it is right now i'll have to insert that right here later I'm not a comedy person. And so let me come back from comedy to serious, but with a really strong female lead. What I've been watching lately is The Diplomat. Oh, how is that? It is excellent. Now, imagine Veep, okay? <laughs> but instead of being a comedy, it's serious like the West Wing. That's uh, right. So we don't have to do a correcting the record on this. All right. <laughs> How about you? What are you watching? I have not actually been watching a lot of stuff lately. I have been more streaming podcasts and music. And I've been listening to one of the ultimate modern rock playlists, which was the Modern Rock 500 by WOXY. WOXY was a station that you might remember Rain Man talking about in Rain Man, bam, the future of rock and roll, he would off, <laughs> he would say. And it uh, pops up here and there in pop culture. It was a small station not far from Cincinnati, Ohio. It often took number one in Rolling Stone readers' polls of best rock stations in the U.S. It was amazing. And it only lasted for about a decade, but then it was revived as an internet radio station and then it moved to Austin, Texas, and was arrived a second time. So 
that was its third incarnation. And then there was recently a bunch of DJs that worked there, got back together and started podcasting about it. And they decided to bring it back. The Modern Rock 500 was something they did every summer where they would, DJs would pick 500 of the best songs that the station played and have a countdown that lasted all weekend long. So the latest one, it's on Spotify. So if you go look for W-O-X-Y on Spotify, you can find the playlist for the last modern rock 500 that they'll probably ever do yeah that's awesome yep okay uh let's start talking about the saint both of these episodes that we're about to talk about happened in 1965 they were from season three and season four one toward the end of season three and one toward the beginning of season four but i'm gonna give you a little background to the year in between 1964 and a little bit about 1965 on January 20th of 1964, Meet the Beatles came out. I used to have that on vinyl. Actually, it was my dad's, but yeah, <laughs> I think he got rid of all his records. And I was like, no, I could have like paid off my student loans with that first pressing of Meet the Beatles. I don't know if mine is a first pressing, but we actually have been listening to Meet the Beatles on vinyl because... I got my son a record player for his 14th birthday, which could have gone either way. It either could have just sat there collecting dust or it could have been his favorite thing. And thank goodness it was the latter. And my parents brought a whole box full of their old records, among them like the White Album on vinyl and Meet the Beatles and just like a bunch of uh, Fleetwood Mac rumors, like a bunch of awesome stuff. So anyway, I know what you mean. It sounds really great on vinyl. Well, vinyl is awesome. I was just at the record store yesterday, but I was at the record store in Boston and I live in Vermont and it was so hot yesterday. I was like, God, there's so many good records here that I can't get. And I don't like mail ordering records. And uh, I was like, you know, it's never going to survive the car ride back. It's just too hot. They will be yeah. warped by the time they get home. And that's one of the reasons I don't recommend buying records by mail either. You got to go to a record store. Meet the Beatles was not the first uh, U.S. Beatles release, though. That was introducing the Beatles, which came out about 10 days earlier on a different record label and initiated a long-running legal battle. February 6th of 1964, Cuba sh cuts off the water supply to the Guantanamo Bay Naval Base, U.S. Naval Base, in a reprisal for the U.S.'s seizure of four Cuban fishing boats off the coast of Florida. So tensions high with Cuba, all eyes on the Caribbean at this time. March 14th, a jury in Dallas, Texas, finds Jack Ruby guilty of killing John F. Kennedy's assassin, Lee Harvey Oswald. April 13th, at the 36th Academy Awards ceremony, Sidney Poitier becomes the first African-American to win an Academy Award for Best Actor for his role in Lilies of the Field. May 1st, at four in the morning, John George Kemeny and Thomas Eugene Kurtz run the first program written in BASIC, computer language which they created as part of the Dartmouth College computer time-sharing system. It was also the first computer language I learned and wrote a program in. June 14th, Haiti's new constitution made Francois Papadoc Duvalier president for life with absolute power all the ballots came pre-marked with yes for a constitutional amendment to allow this, and there was no limit on times someone could vote. It passed with 2.8 million yeses to 3,234 noes. Even if he hadn't been nominated as president for life, he still won the general election with 1,320,748 yeses and zero no votes. Hmm. Duvalier was a voodoo priest who used voodoo to increase his power and standing in the Black community of Haiti. He often dressed as the voodoo spirit of the dead, Baron Samedi, who you might be familiar with. The, that is the voodoo 
uh, guy that is dressed in a uh, top hat and tuxedo and uh, often dark glasses and a skull face. Sometimes uh, cotton plugs in the nostrils like an undertaker would have. Baron Smetti is also known as Uncle Skeleton. During Duvalier's reign of terror, tens of thousands of Haitians were killed and many more were raped, imprisoned, and tortured. He would have his more significant enemies decapitated and supposedly would sit in the bath with his top hat on to consult with them. <laughs> July 8 in Haiti, the secret police force of Duvalier, the Tonton Macoutes, I don't know how to pronounce it, my French isn't great, they arrested Joe Gaitien, a Haitian football player, which is what we call soccer, who had been on the U.S. national team in the 1950 World Cup, and he was never seen again. His family opposed Duvalier, and they were taken to Fort Dimanche prison, tortured and presumably killed. August 5th, 13 young Haitian exiles from New York calling themselves Jeune Haiti, which means Young Haiti, at Petite Rivière de Damerie, Haiti, they land there with the intention of overthrowing Duvalier. They were rumored to be back by the CIA. They were all killed over the next few months. So this is another Bay of Pigs kind of thing, except in Haiti. Since several of them were originally from the town of Jeremy, Duvalier ordered reprisals against their family members. And between August and October of 64, killed at least 27 people. We, we have 27 names, but could be up in the hundreds, actually. Many others weren't killed, but were imprisoned, raped, tortured, or expelled from the region, and several local families were completely wiped out. From August 21st to September 5th, Hurricane Cleo slams the Caribbean and the southeastern United States. It first hits land in Barbados and then uh, makes its way all the way up to Norfolk, Virginia. But by far, the worst hit is Haiti, which takes the brunt of it. Of the 156 total fatalities caused by Cleo, 132 of them were in Haiti. In 1965, January 30th, the state funeral of Winston Churchill takes place in London, the largest assembly of dignitaries in the world until. Pope John Paul II. February 25th, Sibau, this episode of The Saint Airs. March 2nd, in the Vietnam War, Operation Rolling Thunder begins. That's the bombing campaign by the U.S. Air Force. And it goes on for three and a half years. <laughs> April 24th, the Dominican Civil War breaks out in the Dominican Republic. That is the nation that occupies the other half of the island of Hispaniola from Haiti. And on April 27, 3,500 U.S. citizens were evacuated. July 8th, the abductors episode of the St. Heirs. Today, I want to focus on our leading man, Roger Moore and how he became associated with the project and a little bit about his background. Uh, since we haven't profiled him yet as one of our bonds, I'm going to save bond-related trivia for a future time. But I found his early life and work kind of interesting. And listening to interviews with him talk, even at 90, at some of his later interviews, he's still as effortlessly charming as ever. He was born in 1927, the only child of a London policeman. So even though he's got this very polished, cultured, debonair character that he seems to always play, that is definitely not where he came from. He mostly lived in London growing up, except when he was evacuated to Devon during the Blitz, then came back home. Just so happened when his father was investigating a robbery at the home of film director Brian Desmond Hurst, more was tagging along that day and struck up a conversation, told Hearst that he was interested in showbiz and was hired as an extra for the 1945 film Caesar and Cleopatra, where he developed a little bit of a reputation with the ladies. He was very popular. He had some off-camera female fans. 
and based on this charm and you know the fact that he was able to hold his own as an extra Hearst decided to pay Moore's way to go to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art so not at all the typical Hollywood story of being a legacy or just being wealthy enough to afford to pick up acting he happened to be at the right place at the right time and apparently spent a lot of time shadowing his dad as a police officer. Moore stayed at Rada for three terms, but at 18, shortly after World War II, he was conscripted for national service into the Royal Army Service Corps as a second lieutenant, and then quickly moved up to be an officer in the Combined Services Entertainment Section, which is basically the Brits version of the USO. So he was stationed in West Germany looking after entertainers for the armed forces in Hamburg, which is just a very interesting picture to have of Roger Moore. <laughs> yeah. Being, being stationed and, and just kind of like looking after other singers and comics and actors and whatnot. I could go down a whole rabbit hole about learning more about the combined services entertainment section, but something about the title of this makes it sound... I don't know. It doesn't sound like the USO. It sounds like something actually much sillier and Monty Python-esque, but, you know, future reading. If you if you all want to go report back or if you happen to be experts in the combined services entertainment section, please write to us <laughs> at Eric, what's the address? <laughs> How many times have I said this and you still don't know? <laughs> GC8 podcast. That's letter G, letter C, and the number eight GC8 podcast all one word at gmail.com yeah so please write to us if you happen to be experts in the combined services entertainment section and want to chime in uh, about whether this was in fact a serious or silly organization moving on in the early 1950s roger moore had by then picked up a few small acting roles here and there supporting characters in major films, films starring Elizabeth Taylor, but nothing where he was going to get a major credit. So he also did some modeling. He actually became very famous as a model for UK knitwear, earning him the nickname, The Big Knit, which I had never heard before. <laughs> the but... Big Knit, that is not a compliment. <laughs> like... <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, just thinking about how good Roger Moore looks in ski wear in the James Bond films, I could absolutely believe it. He also did advertisements for other products like toothpaste and, you know, based on the smile, you can just picture that. But he didn't get his breakout role until Ivanhoe, which was an adaptation of the famous romantic novel by Sir Walter Scott. Apparently, he got trampled by horses a couple times during the course of, of filming this, but was still totally game. Ivanhoe recorded 1958 to 1959, which ran concurrently with some of his other film projects. Then he moved over to Warner Brothers in 1959, where he was in one episode of Alfred Hitchcock Presents, which is relevant. We were referencing that in our last episode. And a couple other shows, including an adaptation of The Third Man, which was TV version of the Orson Welles film. He then started, and these this seems totally inexplicable to me, but he was in a couple TV shows that are like very American, <laughs> like core, you know, American Western style shows, which I have to say, you know, even though you can sort of picture Roger Moore in a cowboy hat, like I, I had trouble picturing him being out in the American West, but he did very well in a TV show called The Alaskans, which was from 1959 to 1960. And then he became more famous to American audiences when he had a turn in the show Maverick, where he played Bo Maverick, the English accented cousin of the main character. Of course. Yes, <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, but I had no idea Roger Moore was, was in Maverick. So, so that was a fun discovery. That finally set him up for his role in The Saint. 
which was something he was a huge fan of the books and he had tried to buy the production rights to the books himself but was unable to buy them from Charteris so he was thrilled when they approached him to play the character and he did eventually become a co-owner of the show so this was a serious passion project for more he was really he directed some of the episodes didn't he yeah, he, I mean, by the time the season wrapped, like this was his project. Like he he was really one of the main driving forces behind it. And some of it was that he really liked the idea of playing a hero character who was not all white hat. That, uh, and this is something I haven't read the books, but his interpretation of the books is that the character must be a criminal himself. That that, that goes a long way to explaining his motivations. And maybe it's very explicit in the books. It is certainly not explicit in the TV show. I have not read any of the Charteris stories in many, many decades. My recollection was that, yes, he was a little more like um, Thomas Crown. He was kind of like a thief heist kind of guy. Now, that's a dim recollection. It could be completely off base. Again, someone can write in and tell us if we're wrong there or if my memories are incorrect. Now, he did do heroic things, so he's a bit of an anti-hero, but also a criminal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that that explained, first of all, all of his experience and connections, but also his general demeanor of not being unwilling to get his hands dirty, basically. But off screen, playing a character like this had advantages as well, because Roger Moore sort of jokes about this in interviews. Since he's not playing a pure goody two shoes, Superman, good guy, no one would give him a hard time if he got caught on camera smoking or having a drink, because that was all part of this (laughs) character being sort of a bad boy. Just a minute, folks. Yes, that's all it takes to visit our refreshment counter in the lobby. There you'll find popcorn and an assortment of popular candy bars to please every taste. Try one of these delicious candy bars. Big Time, Butternut, Milkshake, Payday. Topped with Hollywood's super rich coating of the kind you like best. They taste wonderful. They're delicious. They're nutritious. Get one at our confection counter in the lobby now. For... The lobby segment here, I'm not going to give you a recipe. This is back to what our lobby segment was originally about, food or drink pairings. What goes good with this thing we're about to view? And this was a total accident, but this, I swear to God, is what I had to eat while I was watching this first episode, Shabao. I live in Vermont, as I had mentioned, so I eat a lot of Ben and Jerry's ice cream. And I had a big dish of chunky monkey ice cream. It didn't occur to me at the time, but it occurred to me afterward, this is the perfect pairing because today's episode takes place in Haiti. Haiti's biggest exports include cocoa, sugar, and bananas. And that's basically <laughs> the ingredients of uh, chunky monkey ice cream. So I was like, okay, th- that's very appropriate. So my recommendation for a pairing for Sabao is a dish of Ben and Jerry's chunky monkey ice cream. I normally don't plug a brand name on this show, but this time it's necessary because there's nothing quite like it. All right. That sounds perfect. And for, for those of you who don't know, we're recording at 9 30 a.m in uh the greater vermont new hampshire area and it is somehow already like 80 degrees outside and neither of us has air conditioning so actually chunky monkey right now at 9 30 a.m sounds excellent i know i'm tempted to go get some right now let's talk about season three episode 21 of the saint sibau So as I said earlier, this opens in Haiti. We're in a nightclub and there is a dancer doing a voodoo dance. I actually remember this opening from seeing it as a kid or when I first discovered the scene. This was definitely 
one of the more memorable openings of a Saint episode. He's dressed like Baron Samedi, who I mentioned earlier. Remember this dancer. I will talk about him in a future episode. This is Bosco Holder, who also did all the voodoo dancing choreography in this episode. Not just this drumming voodoo music, but all the music in the Saint series is, in my opinion, one of the highlights of it, including that opening theme for the Saint. Music is just something that is really well done in this series. One of the things that impressed me about the opening is just the immediate sense of Simon Templer as a British man traveling abroad with ease. One of the things I was paying attention to in this episode was kind of how some of the post-colonial or (laughs) mid-colonial British (laughs) stuff was going to play out in this series relative to you know, the later Bonds that Roger Moore is in since by the time he was Bond in the 70s and 80s, Britain had many fewer territories than they did, you know, kind of leading into this time period. So I was sort of looking for that and just kind of wondering like, oh, I wonder how this portrayal is going to be different in the early 60s. I actually didn't find it to be quite as problematic as I expected it to for the time period. But I did notice that this is something that they're building about his character is that he's a British man traveling in Haiti and knows his way around. Yeah. As part of this whole voodoo stuff that we get at the beginning, he meets Sabao, played by Jean Rowland. She dumps out this bag of sand and says she's going to tell him what his name is. And it's revealed that it is Simon Templer. And that's where we get the opening music. He goes back to talk to his a couple of his friends back at his hotel. It's obviously a set, but Roger Moore helps sell this by slapping a mosquito in the very beginning. And I'm like, oh, that was a nice bit of improv there, like <laughs> slapping at his neck, like, like he just got bit by a mosquito. He and his two friends, they go back the next night to the same place. And one of them, Mr. Krieger, gets really drunk. And he's going off on how, you know, voodoo is a sham. And Sabao says that his name isn't actually Krieger. And she reveals that his real name, in the same way by pouring out the sand and divining it, is actually David Grant if her voodoo is to be believed. One of the things that's interesting is from the get-go, Simon Templer, like from the moment that she reveals his name, he's like, this is real. Like he says, it's possible I'm wrong, but this really seems like a real magic to me, which was interesting just comparing that to in Dr. No, when Connery's Bond is very skeptical of the idea of there being a dragon on the island. Like, like, no, there's no dragon on the island. <laughs> like, very, just like, immediately like, no. Yeah. So this is a very different kind of approach to the, to a similar character who is like macho, worldly, generally very skeptical. But in this case, it seems like we as the audience are also supposed to buy into it with sort of a like maybe I'm wrong but this looks real Sabao is beckoned away from them by presumably the club owner they're a net lord he beckons her away she goes up and leaves them meanwhile in a an office looking out the window net lord also signals to a guy to sabotage the brakes on a car that happens to be the car Krieger is driving On the way back, Krieger loses control of the car and hits Sabao and her brother. Kills the brother. Sabao is knocked unconscious when she's discovered by the other two, Simon Templer and the other friend. They find Sabao and her brother and Krieger. Sabao says that Krieger will be dead by morning for this. This is when we meet the actual medical doctor here. I wanted to bring him up because while he's treating Krieger, 
he actually takes voodoo seriously. And if they say he'll be dead by morning, he thinks that he's going to be dead by morning. And he tells Templar, when you see something that you know is impossible, leave room in your mind for doubt. Hmm. That was the one thing he told him when it comes to voodoo. Templar then goes to a voodoo funeral where Netlord tells him Krieger deserves to die. When they leave, Templar's jeep stalls out, and by the time they get to Krieger, his back is broken, just like Sabal's brothers was. The public understanding of what has happened is not that the brakes in the car were cut. The public understanding is that this guy was horribly intoxicated and yeah. got behind the wheel. And even as an audience member, before you know what is what, I think we know that the brakes are cut on the car, but we also believe that he really is totally wasted and getting behind the wheel of the car. And there are a lot of jokes in the beginning of this at the expense of uncouth, blunt, idiotic Americans who can't hold their liquor, basically. So in the sense of like, this guy's got to die, it's because of this reckless endangerment that they all perceive. We then find out shortly after that that he was not, in fact, intoxicated, that he was putting on a very, very good show. And perhaps the only person who knew it was Netlord. Yeah. Templar searches his room and discovers that he was indeed named David Grant or had an alias as David Grant. He is a spy. So Templar calls the Pentagon in Washington, <laughs> D.C., Apparently, at this point in the series, Templar is already connected to the world of espionage. And they know who he is, and they, they're going to send someone to fill him in on what Grant was working on that was, quote, pretty hot. They want to hire Templar to take over his investigation into Netlord, who was supposedly involved in Cuba with Castro in British Guiana when the troubles started there. And now he is there where they're having issues between Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Now, this is actually really believable because as we in sitting here in 2023 know, the US and large powers like Russia frequently hire mercenaries to do their dirty work and <laughs> stuff like that. This has been all over the news lately because of the war in Ukraine. But also, as I gave it the background, there was a lot of worry that Haiti and or the Dominican Republic would go communist just like Cuba. And there was an active revolution happening in the Dominican Republic. And there was this strong man to extract aid from the U.S. was flirting with the idea of going communist in the Duvalier go government, Papa Doc. He sort of played both sides of the fence on that. So this, this is actually very timely if you were to be watching this in 1965. Netlord invites Templar for dinner. He also says he's engaged to Sabal. Sabal sends a protection amulet, this voodoo amulet, to Templar's hotel room. But he decides to take his own protection, a Walter <laughs> PPK, all right? The yeah. Bond gun. It was a conscious choice, if it was a choice. <laughs> right. Well, also, there's a reason that Bond carried it. It was a very reliable gun. It's not hard to imagine that they could independently have come up with that. But given its connection to Bond and that the Bond franchise was super hot at this time, it's more likely that they're like, oh, give him a Walter. <laughs> <laughs> We find out that Netlord intends to marry into the voodoo cult through Sabao. He drugs Templar's wine at dinner. This results in a fight. Netlord shoots Templar. We later find out that Templar survives due to the protection amulet, which stops the bullet, this metal ah. disc that he had on under his clothes. In our final scene, Netlord is being purified to be initiated into the voodoo cult and Templar arrives and interrupts. What we know from their dinner conversation is that 
regardless of whether you believe in the magic part of voodoo, there are lots of people in Haiti who believe in voodoo and will follow a voodoo priest. And this is how Papa Doc Duvalier kept control of Haiti. Basically, he was a voodoo priest and people were afraid of him and his, you know, his death squads. But yeah, he, uh, <laughs> so there were real reasons to be afraid of him, but there were also superstitious reasons to be afraid of him. I don't know if he had expansionist tendencies, but this character, Netlord, certainly does. He thinks not only is he going to take over Haiti, but he's eventually going to take over Africa and South America. You know, he's eventually going to grow this voodoo cult to the point where it becomes a global power. Templar tries to tell the current, I think they're called Houdan, the a voodoo priest, that Netlord is not a good person. And so... It's decided that they're going to solve this via uh, the test of the serpents. Okay, um, can I can I pause yeah. here? Go ahead. I have a little a little parenthetical note here that just says shark meter question mark. Do we get do we where where do we draw the line on the shark meter? Like do poisonous snakes in think... this context get a shark meter? Like even just like a beep. Do Maybe the tiny, the faintest ping off in the distance. And the reason I say that is because sharks and, and snakes are fundamentally different. Uh, so, <laughs> so not only are sharks aquatic and snakes usually are not aquatic. If it was an aquatic snake, I'd say something different. But the thing that, that is usually true about, about them that might work here is that they have to go where they can't see. They have to reach into a basket and uh, of snakes and whether or not they get bitten or not, we'll see. Which reminds me more of, rather than a shark meter, I think our Flash Gordon meter is pinging here. <laughs> Although that came a lot later, the, the scene where another future Bond. Is that going to be Timothy Dalton? Tim Timothy Dalton has to reach in and see if he gets bitten by a poisonous creature uh, again, you know, in a test versus Flash Gordon. Um, so anyway, shark meter, eh, maybe slightly, possibly, but I, I don't think this qualifies as a true shark meter, like Dr. No qualified as a true shark meter. They reach in and Templar is not bitten. Netlord is bitten and dies. But... In the final reveal, Twilight Zone style, we see that the serpents are revealed to be nothing but ropes in this basket. So what happened? What do you believe? Do you believe in voodoo or not? Gene Roland, who plays Sabao in this, also had an uncredited role in the second season of The Saint in episode 21, where she was a secretary. She was a bit of a scream queen in Hammer stuff and other horror films of the time. And she's a Bond girl, kind of. Yeah. Do you remember her? No. Yeah, you probably blotted it out of your mind, as did I. She was the captain of the guards in Casino Royale 1967. Oh, yep. Yeah, definitely tried to scrub that as much as possible. <laughs> and we haven't watched it yet, but she's also going to be Bond's masseuse in You Only Live Twice. So that's a legitimate connection yeah. to the Bond franchise. So again, here we are watching The Saint and seeing that it has more connections to the Bond world than just Roger Moore. I definitely liked the fact that it's playing with this supernatural and doing it in a way that doesn't feel too campy it's just enough to reveal a new dimension of the character seeing how simon templar responds to not having complete control over everything or not being the one who has all the connections but instead just seeing how he responds to these other powers and is a very careful politician for lack of a better word really kind of navigating like okay you know Sabao really is the person 
who has the power here in this sphere and the voodoo cult. And my job is just to make sure they don't get accidentally dicked over by this horrible guy. And if I can focus my attention on revealing him as a fraud, Simon, of course, has no interest in power himself in this area. But it's interesting seeing him navigate that where he's not taking charge of the situation. He's more responding to it. And I think it's a nice way to add some variety to the show. Yeah, I liked seeing an episode where Simon Templer was outside of a city. The scenes when they're out on the road with the Jeep and of course the stuff in the club, the voodoo stuff in this is really well done, especially that opening dance. But there's other voodoo dancing that happens later at the ceremony, which is really cool too. So I think that was all great. I think we have to wrap this up, Thul. If you want to talk to us, you are free to email us at gc8podcast. That's letter G, letter C, number eight, podcast at gmail.com. We release every date with an eight. So the eighth, the 18th, and the 28th of each month. And until next time, this is Eric. This is Johanna. Signing off. Sharks and and snakes are fundamentally different.